Hey gang, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio. We talk about the Beatles on all of our shows, and we could talk about any aspect of their careers, their days together, their solo years. We talk to authors, we talk to podcasters. And this time out, we have a special guest who's been on the channel a few times. She was on uh, most recently with Scott R. McKinley. Um, she is Jude Kessler, and she has put out a series of books on John Lennon, and she hopes to finish them all up sometime in the near future. Altogether, I think she told me nine or ten books in total. Which, what was the number, Jude? Yeah, we're probably at ten now because I had to split volume five into two parts. So I wanted to do nine to honor John with his connection to the number nine, but I, you know, it, it looks like it's going to be 10 books and I'm working on what will be volume six. It's, it's book five, part two right now. And I wanted to go all the way to Candlestick Park when George says, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Beatle anymore. That was going to be the ending of that book, but we're into about page 600 and something right now and they're only finishing up rubber soul so we're still we haven't gone on the uk tour mm. uh you know we got lots in 1966 to get to candlestick park so i think i'm going to end that one in right before they start making revolver when um you know they've finished up in the studio and Ringo and John and their wives have gone on vacation and of course you've got the christmas record for that year and um there just there's so much there's so much that happened in 1965 that it's bumped it to 10 books there's so much that happened in every year every every <laughs> it's every it's packed year. on a day-by-day -day basis it's amazing all that they accomplished and barely had time to breathe especially in the early years too when they were really promoting themselves I know. Well, you look at making Hard Day's Night, they would have John had to be getting up around 630, which I'm sure was a killer because he's got to come 27 miles in traffic into the city to film. They've got to be in hair and makeup by 715 to 730 because at 8 a.m. sharp, they start making the film. Mm. At noon, they go either sit in a car to do an interview or or someone comes and they go sit in another room and they do an interview. They record all afternoon. The stars, the other stars, the co-stars go home. The Beatles then are taken to a studio to do a TV special or an interview. And then John gets home at 10 and the publisher from Jonathan Cape, Tom Mashler, is waiting for him because he's got to get a book out. And he's editing the book and drawing his illustrations. I'm guessing he probably goes to bed around one and he's up at 630 and does it all again. Who lives like that's that? Crazy. Yeah, that's how it was. Yeah. <laughs> at that time. Yeah. You know, between the recording studio, the BBC appearances, the movies, the concerts, it was incredible. <laughs> how did they get through it all? incredible and they really for all that they're asked to do and it's quite a bit and a lot of it's stuff they didn't want to do like the Beatles Christmas show they don't complain they do what they're asked to do I mean they they grumble to Brian but they do it and a lot of people would have said uh, no I'm not gonna do that but mm -hmm. they they do it so you gotta you gotta they have a work ethic that's unequaled Absolutely. By the way, just want to point out this book on the Things We Said Today podcast. We just interviewed Dana Klosner and you are mentioned in there. And it even says that when you wrote your first book on John, it took you 12 years. Was 20. it 20 years? to yeah. write? Oh, my God. Yeah, because I was raising a little boy and I was working full time as um, a an executive director for the YMCA and I was having to do it when I could, you know, and then I, seven of those years, I went back and forth to Liverpool doing interviews. So I was working on it, but I was doing other things. And then once my son and daughter, because my, my daughter-in-law was also my daughter, she lived with me, uh, with my husband and me for almost two years. And, um, she really came into our family, because she needed a place to stay. And, and my son said, I know this girl, she, she really needs a good home. 
and she came to stay with us. We loved her. I've never loved any. I mean, she's the daughter I didn't know that I needed and wanted. And she is my best friend. And um, so, you know, we had her as well. We we were parenting. And so it, it took a long time. But this will be coming up on May 1st will be my 38th year of doing the John Lennon series. <laughs> See, folks, that's the kind of commitment that you get from Jude Kessler. <laughs> <laughs> it's my life. <laughs> and and Dana even says in her book that the level of detail that you go through on every single event, every activity involving the Beatles and John, it's just remarkable, all the well, research that you do. So it's it's really kind of been a necessity because as you and I have talked about this before. I had zero idea that there was such a thing as fan fiction. Never heard of it. Mm. So I thought, oh, well, I'll write this like a narrative and people will love it because they'll feel like they're there. But I'll make sure that I tell exactly what happened. And so the first book, I drop the sources in at the end of the chapter, but I don't footnote everything because I don't realize that I have to. Mm. By book two, I'm hearing people say, oh, that's just made up. And so I'm like, oh, I got to document this stuff. So I start I, in that book. I had like 300 and some odd footnotes. Then I still hear, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that Don't get that. That's not, that's not real. So then the next book, there are 2000 footnotes almost. Yeah. I'm, I'm footnoting everything. Now we have four to 6,000 footnotes because I'm making sure that people know where did this come from and what are people saying? They don't, they don't agree. They disagree. I mean, the Elvis chapter, when the Beatles meet Elvis, I had 80 some odd pages of notes and everybody tells a different story. Mm. And I mean, it's just, <laughs> they're, they don't agree on what Elvis wore. They don't agree on whether the Beatles jammed or didn't jam. Mm. They don't agree on what Brian was doing. They don't, they don't agree on anything. So you have to really make sure that you document what you're saying so people know this is as close as we can get to the truth. Yeah, well, as long as you're talking about that, I'm finishing up uh, Ivor Davis's book where he goes into detail about that. Yes. And he seems to be sharp in, in his yes. memory of what happened there. Yes. So based on all the other research that you went through about the Beatles and Elvis, how do you feel about Ivor's recounts. Ivor spot on. Ivor will not be swayed from what he saw, heard, and experienced. And no matter what people say, for example, I talked to him at least three or four times before I released the book on 1964, which is should have known better. And I said, Ivor, in your book, you say the Beatles did not smoke pot with Bob Dylan in the Delmonico, that it was the last night of the tour in New York, it's still right. in New York, but that it was the last night of the tour after they did their charity concert, Bob Dylan came out to the hotel, which was out of town, not in the middle of town. They weren't as heavily guarded because they're going home the next day. Mm -hmm. and if they're caught smoking pot. It's not going to ruin the tour. Tour's over with. Mm -hmm. So it's not a risk. He said, Yes. He goes, I can, I remember Dylan coming in, the rucksack on his back. They go in, we can smell the stuff coming out. He goes, it's Larry Kane, Art Shriver, me, Ron Joy. He's listing everyone that's out there. And he goes, you can call them. And they come out, they're all trying to act normal, but they're kind of giggling and, mm. you know, and we knew what was going on. And he goes, I was at the Delmonico as well. And I am here to tell you, savvy, scrupulous, careful Brian Epstein did not let those boys chance the 1964 tour that he and everyone else had worked so hard to put together. He wouldn't have let them do that. It was the last night of the tour. So I started going back and looking at everywhere that Paul references it. He says New York, but he does not say the Delmonico. So mm. right before the book went out, I call Ivor back and said, okay, I'm going with this. But people are going to say I'm wrong. And he goes, you're not wrong. This is right. I'm telling you, he, he is so, I've never known anyone to get sharper and smarter with every single year. He, he is into technology. He's not afraid to try new things. 
the man's brilliant. Wow. Well, I'm hoping to interview him very soon and uh, possibly next week. <laughs> so and, we're going to be talking about Elvis. We'll be talking about Dylan. And yeah. The and the stuff that he did that's non beatle like being one of Reagan's boys on the bus, being five feet away from Bobby Kennedy when he shot, because he's, right. he's traveling with Bobby Kennedy. Um, be, he posed as a student on the day that James Meredith entered Ole Miss because no reporters were allowed. So he slept on the floor in the dorm the night before so he could cover the story. He's great friends with Muhammad Ali. He's friends with Steve McQueen, Ali McGraw, Elizabeth Taylor, the man... Not to mention his work with the Charles Manson story. Yeah. His book was court record. Look, Ira Davis, there is no other. Yeah, he's a gem. Yeah. And uh, I, I can't wait to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, before we start with our number nine dream show, you wanted to mention qu something quickly about the audio book. Yes. That came out for she, Lo she Loves You. And we had Scott R. McKinley with you. Yes. That long ago to talk about that. What did yeah. you want to say about it? I just want to urge everyone to give it a try. You can listen to a free sample, five minutes, but it is 1963 and the early part of 64. So it's Ed Sullivan and Carnegie Hall and Washington, D.C. and all of those good things. But it's also the Royal Command performance and um, Sunday night, the London Palladium. It's the big events, the outbreak of Beatlemania. But it was always my dream to give people a way to relive the Beatles story, to be there with them. And because Scott McKinley is so meticulous with the voices and studied them so carefully and re reproduces them so carefully, you absolutely feel as if you're there. And I, I just can't say enough about how you're transported back into that time and hope that everybody will give it a try. It's on every single audiobook format, whatever you want to use, whether it's Audible or Chirp or whatever. It's on every one. And it's 33 hours with the Beatles. Wow. What could, what could be better than that? <laughs> yeah. And you say that because um, you're not finished yet with volume six, which is Shades of Life part two. It's also titled uh, Some Some Forever. Yeah. Okay, and but you can pre-order that on your website. That's exactly right at johnlennonseries.com. Um, it it is going to be so chock a block because it's Shea Stadium and that very dangerous 1965 tour. I mean, things got really dangerous in 65 when San Francisco people were throwing folding chairs and the stage looks like a riot had occurred. There are videos of it mm. all over YouTube and they're their girls passed out all over the stage. Uh, they were throwing shoes. They were throwing lipstick cases in Houston. They rushed the plane and almost run into the propellers. Then smoking cigarettes, they climb on the wings. And and Brian says, well, can we just take off and, and go to another airport? And John said, what are you going to do about these people on the wings? Give a prize for the one who can hang on the longest, you know? Yeah, we can't do that. And it is, it, it's a very exciting tour, of course, meeting Elvis and San Diego where their bus was surrounded and they're rocking the bus. And I mean, there's, there's a lot going on in that book, the making of rubber soul, the MBE investor tour, it, there's a lot. And Ken Womack was the one that said, you cannot name this Shades of Life Part 2. And I said, why not? And he goes, people are going to be confused. They don't know which book to buy. It's going to be confusing. You have to come up with a separate name for it the way he did with his uh, George Martin series, hmm. Maximum Volume. And he, he said, you because they need, it'll be too confusing. So that's why it's some forever. Okay. Well, you either title your books the title of a of a Beatles song, yes, or a line from, yes, you know, yeah. And they always start with S, and no one knows why. Not even me. <laughs> oh, that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> no, I don't know. It just it happened. It would should have been there was the first one, which I love because that's John with his friends when they're teenagers, and and one of his friends, Bill Turner, corrects John's grammar. And, you know, he, John says something about me and Pete did something and Bill Turner says, Pete and I, 
And Johnny goes, shut up, Turner. You aren't even there. You should have been there. And <laughs> you know, from there, we have, should have been there. And then Shivering Inside was just so perfect for 61, 63, where he's pretending to be in charge and he's anything but in charge. I mean, he's, he's deeply, deeply struggling and depressed. And so then I said, well, I'll just stick with that theme. So I have, but who knows why. Okay. And uh, the next volume will be coming out, well, you're hoping, <laughs> March of 2025. Right, right. Okay. All right. Keep us posted thank on you. the status of everything. And thank you for having me on. I, I, I'll i tell everyone that I told uh, Ken before the show started that, you know, this is not my wheelhouse. I am not a music expert. And I've listened to many of his podcasts and his guests are so knowledgeable and so savvy. And he knows everything there is to know about the music. And when they started talking about, well, in the this release, you got this bonus and you got this track. And I, was, I said to my husband, I just don't know that. I, I just don't know it. I'm a biographer. And he said, then talk about it from the point of view of John's biography. So we're kind of where I'm coming from today is that when John could not sing his heart, he would speak his mind and he is, he sings his heart and you hear it. And you and I talked about this last time when we did the show with Scott and you said, well, how do you know these things? How do you know that that's real? So I did tons of research on the people that were around John and how we know that he is really singing his heart, that this is about his life. Hmm. So. Well, he said those same words in Julia. Yep. So. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Yep. So for those of you who are not familiar with the number nine dream concept, and we haven't done this for quite a while now, I'm really looking forward to this. I asked my guest to pick a beetle that he or she wants to talk about. In this case, it will be, of course, John. And then I come up with three categories in which my guest has to come up with their top three, whether it's songs or albums. And the three categories for this show will be top three non-hits from John from the Beatle days. So in other words, it has to be a song that John wrote where he was either the complete writer or the main writer, and he sings lead, songs that you always associate with John, but they couldn't be hit songs. And like I said, he had to have written it, so it's not a cover version. You can't say Twist and Shout. Well, that was a hit anyway, but <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So it has to be an original song that John was the main writer or, or he wrote the entire song, and they can't be hits, the top three. Top three solo Lennon studio albums. So that means no live albums, no greatest hits, no compilations, no soundtracks. The albums from Plastic Auto Band through Milk and Honey, right. basically. Um, your top three in that co uh, category. And then finally, top three Lennon vocals of all time. That's Beatles and Solo. So Jude is going to share all three categories with us. Three answers in three categories, three times three, you get nine. That's our number nine dream. So yeah. let's start with top three non-hits from John from the Beatle days. Which three did you come up with? Start with one of them. Okay. Well, because you guys are listening to this podcast, you obviously are very intense Beatles fans and, and we hope John Lennon fans. So you probably already know the story of John's life, but to encapsulate it very quickly for those who don't know the story, John, um, as a young boy, his mother and Fred Lennon are separated because of World War II. He is away on a transport ship taking soldiers from New York to the war front. She is still in Liverpool. She writes to him and says, yeah, we just got married on a, a bet. It was a bet, but you won't marry me, bet I will. Let's just call this thing off. And he says, no, he's in love with her. Um, when the war is over, we will be happy. We're not getting a divorce. So she's not, she is a strong, bold, bohemian woman, AKA Yoko. She is very intelligent and she does what she wants and she doesn't care about convention. And she first has one boyfriend that she cares about very much who's a sailor 
and that doesn't work out. And then she falls in love with a very handsome man that works at the Adelphi Hotel, has a thin curled mustache and pulls his hat, this trilby hat down over his eye, John Dykins. And so she moves in with him and her family is, this isn't, you know, 2024. This is the 1940s, early 1940s. And her family is aghast. You're living in sin. This is immoral. You know, it, they, they are all unhappy about it. Well, John begins to feel a little bit like a third wheel because they're, John Dykins and Julia love each other. They're very happy together. And he ends up getting on the bus with the green leather seats and going to his Aunt Mimi's house. Not because Mimi's there. Mimi, I'm sure, made him good meals and gave him a nice clean bed to sleep in and did all that. But she's not lovey-dovey. She's anything but lovey-dovey. Okay, his Uncle George, as he calls him, Uncle George um, is fun. He teaches him how to read. He puts him on his lap and teaches him how to read with the Liverpool Evening Echo. He encourages John as he gets to be four and five to start writing little stories and drawing illustrations. And they get him a radio in the room above the glass in porch. And they spoil him because they don't have children. And he's very at home there. So when his father comes back from World War II, he finds John living not with his wife, Julia, but living with his aunt and uncle. So he thinks, look, this is my son. He deserves to live with his father or his mother. So without telling anyone, he takes John and he takes him away to Blackpool. He gets tickets on a ship to take him to New Zealand. He gets a job. He and his friend Billy Hall are going to sell silk stockings on the black market and make a ton of money. He's going to raise this little boy. He wants him. He loves him. He's taking him with him. Bill Harry says, and I so agree, that Fred Lennon is the most disparaged man in the Beatles story. He wanted the boy. And his brother, Sidney, sells him out, calls Julia and says, if you want to know where your son is, he's in Blackpool. Here's the address. And they're leaving tomorrow to go to New Zealand. So you better get over there. So she does. Now, Billy Hall, who's not in the room, he's in the kitchen and the door is closed went to Mark Lewison a few years ago and said, this story about them fighting about the little boy is not true. They had an amicable agreement that Julia would take the boy back to Liverpool and everybody was happy with it. But that is not the story that John told. And John told the story many times. And let's face it, what you believe is truth. What you perceive is your reality. It may not have happened this way, but John always believed that they put him in between the two of them and mm. they made him choose which parent he wanted. And he chose his dad because he'd been with his dad for three weeks. It was fun. They rolled up their pants. They waded in the water. His father taught him to whistle through his teeth. They were two men together and he was having a great time. And his father seemed to love him and want him. But when he saw his mother walk away crying, he ran after her. And you, know, you hear mommy, mommy don't go. She's screaming it. She takes him back to Liverpool, goes straight to her sister's house where the family has agreed in John's absence that John is going to live. Pop Stanley has put his foot down. John, his only male heir, is going to live with the eldest sister, stable Mimi, and her husband, George. She takes him there. He says to her, you're not going to leave me, are you? She said, no, don't be, don't be ridiculous. Go play with your dog. And while he's in the backyard playing with Sally, his little dog, she leaves. And, you know, tell me why you cried and why you lied to me. You know, <laughs> I gave you everything. You left me standing all alone. I mean, it is a tragic moment because she's gone. She's gone for good. And he's going to be living with George and Mimi. So Bill Harry says, that John was to be haunted by Julia for the rest of his life. That's who he wants. And he says it, as we said a minute ago, and Julia, half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it just to reach you, Julia. You know, notice me, look at me, look at me. He really wants her to see him, hear him, get him, and she's gone. So 
when he finds out from his, his cousin that she isn't living in another city, but she's living at one Blomfield Road, which if you cut across the Allerton Golf Course, is about a mile and a half away from Mimi's house. Mm -hmm. He's devastated because it, she's here. She she could come over anytime. And he goes over there and knocks on the door and finds out that not only does she not want him, but she likes children because she has other children. So it's not children she doesn't want. It's him. That's what he thinks. He doesn't know. None of us know until just a few years ago when Auntie Motter called Julia Baird to her side. She's dying and says, Julia's heart was broken. She cried every day of her life for her little boy. She wanted John, but she was told by the family that she was bad for him and evil for him. And she needed, she was a moral and she needed to let that little boy be raised by Mimi. And she gave in to it. None of us knew this. So when I write should have been there, I write it from the point of view of it was a complicated decision, but Julia had to live her own life, which is not true. She was forced into this. So he, he grows up with the two of them and at age 14 and a half, trauma, huge trauma, they find out that George is dying of cirrhosis of the liver and Mimi knows how close he and John are. So knowing nothing about psychology and what happens to people, she sends John away for two weeks to Scotland. George dies. They have the funeral. They bury him. He comes home. He's gone. He didn't get to say goodbye. He didn't get to hug him. He didn't get to, he has no closure. And Mimi says, don't cry, which is what all the Stanleys say. When, when Julia, well, we'll get to that in a minute, but they don't let these children cry. You can't talk about the person. The person is gone. And so she sends him up to his room and he starts laughing and he can't stop. And he laughs for about three or four hours. And finally, Mimi, not knowing what to do, calls his cousin Lilia in and then they call in Julia. And Julia goes up to the room, basically decides that she's going to be part of his life not as a mother he's got a mother she's going to be george she's going to be his best friend she's going to be the one he hangs out with the one that does what uncle george used to do and so he starts going to her house they they go into the pop the toffee the palm shops together and and she wears glasses with no glass in them and reaches through her glasses and scratches her eye and she wears her underwear on her head and she's crazy, you know, and he loves her. He so loves her. And they, the boys come and they practice in her teeny tiny bathroom at one Blomfield road because she has told him, John, listen to me. You have music in your bones. You have music in your bones. You're destined to be a great singer. I'm a singer. I play my banjo in the pubs. Your dad was a great singer. He sung on those transport ships. You got it in your bones and he believes it. And he forms this band and they hang out with her. They could not be any closer. When he's expelled for two weeks from school, he stays at her house the whole time. Mimi has no idea he's expelled. And so in the midst of this bonding that the two of them have she's there at roseberry street when they perform on that lorry at roseberry street she's standing in the audience she is living his dream with him and she comes over to mimi's house to talk about john and the fact that he's not really behaving at school and what are we going to do about it and all that kind of stuff she steps outside ivan vaughn is there she says hi to him you know good night ivan see you steps out into the dual carriageway of men love avenue and is hit by a young police cadet off duty who's drunk. She's not 40 feet in the air. She dies minutes later at the hospital, same hospital where Julian is born. And um, John says, and this is from the anthology, I lost my mother twice, once as a child of five, and then again at 17. It made me very, very bitter. I had just established a relationship with her when she was killed. We caught up on so much in just a few short years. We could communicate. We got on. Deep down inside, I thought, that's it. 
I've got no responsibilities to anyone now. And what he's really saying there is no one loved me anymore. George is gone. And um, now Julia's gone and nobody loves me. And um, it's a bad feeling not to have anybody on the face of the earth who loves you. Bill Harry says he never got over his death. Pete Shotton says, I witnessed John live through unspeakable pain. And Pete says that what John started doing, and he's 17 now, he started going into Liverpool's sleaziest areas to the illegal drinking clubs. And he begged for money on the street. And he would take that and go drink until he would fall out drunk on a bus somewhere trying to get home. Look, this kid was in trauma. If we had a 17-year-old today going through what John went through, we'd get him some help. Mm -hmm. But maybe we weren't going to get him help. She thought he was being ridiculous, you know, put on a brave face. So then he goes on to art college, meets Thelma Pickles. She Thelma helps him a, a good bit. But she, John is still, he's furious. He's raging. And she finally realizes John has one life preserver and he's going to use it for himself. He's not going to, he's not going to be there for her. And, she, and they break up. So he meets Cynthia and she falls head over heels for him. And this is what Cynthia says. This is in on page 27 of her book, John. John wanted proof daily that he mattered most to me. He was even jealous of my friend, Phil. He was jealous of my work. He was a lost soul. And I wanted to give him understanding and acceptance and security of being loved to ease his pain and bitterness. But he wanted me as much as possible to be with him. I had to choose between him and my other needs. He said to me every day, every day, you won't leave me, will you? If I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true and help me understand? Because I've been in love before mm -hmm. and I found that love is more than just holding hands, you right. know? So he's, you hear it in all of the songs. He is wailing at the microphones of the world for Julia, um, you hurt me then. You're back again? No, no, no. And I'm sure he thought that when she comes back in his life, not a second time. I got every reason on earth to be mad because I just lost the only girl I had. Tell me why you cried. I'm a loser. And I lost someone who's dear to me, near to me. He's a real nowhere man living in his nowhere man, making all those nowhere plans for nobody. And John says in his interview with David Sheff, Paul mainly write songs about other people. I write songs about myself. And so the songs, the three that I've chosen are the ones that I feel are his most intimate songs telling you his story. And the first one is There's a Place. I know you probably okay. didn't think that was going to be on the list. No, you mentioned the lyrics of all these other songs, and I'm figuring those are the ones that you're yeah. you put in there. You mentioned yeah. tell me why and I'll cry instead. And I love them all. This was the yeah. hardest podcast I've ever done in my entire life. I listened to every Lennon song there was obsessively. And I've spent like 20 hours trying to come up with, because this is really difficult, really difficult. But so there's a place that it's one of the earliest songs that he ever did. And it dates back to 1960. They're in Hamburg and the boys have found out that they can get a cheap, good, hot breakfast at the Siemens mission. And because they're sleeping through the morning, because they're up all night, they can still get breakfast around lunchtime at the Siemens mission. Well, John has found out that in a side room where the bar, where it's open at night and people are drinking beer and stuff, there's a piano in there. The only problem is it's autumn in Germany and it's freezing cold and that room doesn't have the heater lit in it. Hmm. But he goes in there anyway. The lights are not off. He keeps the door open so that he can see in there. And he goes in there and plunks around on the piano and he begins to write this song. And the reason that I like it so much is in the midst of all of this pain, and we're still, it's only the autumn of 1960, we're still just two years out from Julia's death. In the midst of all of this, he's finding a way to cope. He's finding a way to move forward. And so he writes this intricate blank verse. Um, the rhyme scheme, for those of you that are into rhyme, is A, the next lines are BB, they rhyme, then C, another 
another sound, then D, D, then E, and then C. That's an intricate rhyme scheme, intricate. And the blank verse, blank verse doesn't really have pattern rhyme, but it has rhythm. So we've got rhythm and it's interlocking. There's a place where I can go when I feel low, when I feel blue, and it's my mind. I got to go to my mind. And hmm. there's no time when I'm alone, I think of you. And things you said go around my head like, I love only you. And he rem he's remembering, he's found a place where he can go and feel good. So this song is offering John hope. And every time that he feels low, he can think about those days that he and Julia were together doing these things. Now, the sound of it is so early 1960s. It kind of reminds me of the Dave Clark Five song because it has that mm -hmm. same kind of sound to it or the fortunes, you've got your troubles, I've got mine. It's so classic early 60s. And um, it's not one of his resentful songs. It's not one of his angry songs. It's a song where this kid, truly teenager kid, is finding a way to work out his problems. And he's dropping the mask of sardonic John, hard John, he the, the person he's projecting to the world. And he's opening a door and letting us in to hear what's going on in his head. Um, that opening sound that there's, I can't sing, but you know, that's so hard to do. He's so gifted and the vocal is so strong. So that's my first one. So how do you, how do you feel about that song, Ken? I love it. It's it's an incredible melody, great harmonies on there. I love the harmonica use, and they that was a time when they used the harmonica quite a lot. Yep. I would always question whether or not, you know, it has to do with Julia. And oh. I, you know, according to you, this song is like a a, a song of comfort for him. Yeah. Um. But, you know, even if it didn't have that narrative to it, just as a song by itself, I love it. Yeah. And I, I do know that Paul has said that um, the title came from There's a Place for Us from yes. West Side Story. So I believe that the two of them wrote the song together. But I don't know, you know, it could be mainly a John song. Not quite sure. It could be more 50-50. But it's a great example. It's a funny thing. When when we've talked about this on the Things We Said Today podcast, um, Alan Cozen and myself both thought of the same song. It's very much like In My Room. Yes, it is. Ones. Very much. Just thinking about what's what's in your mind, thinking inward, yeah. you know, getting lost in your own thoughts, in the privacy of your room, that kind of thing. Same thing with um, Strawberry Fields Forever. Yeah. No one, I think, is in my tree. It's yeah. the same idea as that. Yeah. So without it ever having to do with Julia, which it may, you know, it's still a great song to itself. Yeah. You know, can you appreciate the song even if it had, even if it had nothing to do with Julia? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I would prefer that none of these songs had to do with Julia. I would prefer that John just wrote them because he was writing a love song. Unfortunately, I sincerely believe he spent the rest of his life working out these issues. I mean, he's going to primal screen therapy in the beginning of the seventies because he still hasn't worked it out mm. and still suffering and he's still trying. I mean, it, it, I think it haunted his life. I wish it didn't. I wish none of these songs were about her at all, but I think that the fact that it wasn't the, as much the fact that they gave him away for complicated reasons and that Mimi never told John that Fred wrote to him regularly and tore the letters up and threw them away. So he thinks both of his parents have abandoned him. And that's got to be the loneliest feeling in the world that no one wants you. You're mm -hmm. unwanted. But he, I wish that none of them were about what I think they're about. Uh, that would, yes, I absolutely love the song, regardless. Hmm. Do you believe that the majority of songs that John wrote were either about Julia, Cynthia, or Yoko? Yes. Okay. Don't you feel there's a possibility since so many of the early Beatles songs that John was writing or co-writing were just about boy-girl relationships and struggles with them? And if 
if uh, the boy wasn't getting along with the girl or she's breaking up with him. That's just, you know, a formula for songs about relationships at the time. I think there's some that are like that from me to you. I mean, from me to you is just a song song, you know, uh -huh. I'll send it along. And it, there are songs, uh, when I get home, you know, which I think could be about Cynthia, but they're, they're commercial songs, no doubt. Mm -hmm. I don't want to spoil the party. I mean, they're commercial songs, but when John says Paul writes songs about other people, but I always write songs about myself. I think he's telling you, I think that it's his, Samuel Taylor Coleridge writes that poem about the ancient mariner who has caused a horrible thing to happen at sea, or he thinks he's caused it. And he grabs strangers and tells them the story over and over and over because for the moment that he can spill that pain is a catharsis. He's able to go on. And I think John is always trying to tell this story and get over it, get over it, get over it. And he's, and he's on a, it, Arthur Janov says when he came to him, he was almost so crippled with pain that he didn't understand how John could even function. Mm -hmm. And that he gets him to the point, he says, I took him apart, but I didn't get to put him back together again because the visa ran out. They had to go back to England and I didn't get to finish the work. I wish he had been able to finish the work. And then I think John wouldn't have needed Yoko to be with him so much obsessively because he needs someone to be there for him hmm. it's, um, it's a very complicated story but but yeah I do I think there are so I, I think there might be one song for Mimi but I that that would be a big stretch but I've often wondered if girl isn't about Mimi because she's the kind of girl who puts you down when friends are there you feel a fool uh, you know, did she think when she was young that pain would lead to pleasure? She's not nice to him many, many times. She, he, she humiliates him in front of his friends. And I've often wondered if that is the inspiration for this song. We know it's not Cynthia. Cynthia's a lovely, mm -hmm. wonderful person. It's about somebody. Who it is, I don't know. But, you know. Well, my argument has always been if John's never admitted it, how do you know? <laughs> you don't. You don't know. Yeah. You don't. He admits that he's writing about himself. We know that. That much we know. So, It's also a bit unfair of John to say that, that Paul writes about other people. And yes, there are examples of that, but it's not like all of his songs are that way. No, not every song is Eleanor Rigby. No, and, and I would <laughs> say three-fourths of Paul's songs during the Beatle years are about himself. Yeah. He's writing about his relationship with Jane. Try to see it my way. Right. Do we have to keep on talking? Do we can't go on? I'm looking through you. Where did you go? You know, I mean, Paul writes about himself a lot, but you know, John, and I was starting to laughing when I was listening to the podcast with you and Andy Nichols and you're like, yeah, John lists all of those things um, in God that he doesn't believe in, but hmm. 11 days later, he probably changed his mind. That's exactly right, you know? I mean, you know, from day to day, he vacillates, and so do I. I mean, so do we all. Well, probably not me, because I'm so boring. I just like the same thing all the time. But most people, most normal people, change their mind on right. things. John changed his mind a lot. So, yeah, but I agree with you. Paul did not just write about other, other that's, people. That's what makes John Lennon uh, fascinating and at the same time frustrating. Yes. he's not a black and white character he's constantly changing he's like a chameleon yeah. and it's hard to fig figure out where he stood on a lot of things so yeah so you mentioned um there's a place what other two songs okay so the next one is yes it is and um i think it's one of the most undervalued songs in the beatles catalog people brush it off as uh the this boy junior or you know a brother of this boy simply because both of them have the block harmony and both of them have john singing a searing lead vocal and um they you know they're just oh it's the same thing well i think yes it is is the better song because yes it has all those great elements that made this boy so wonderful but it also has something else, which is incredible poetry. Um, John doesn't say, uh, my love wore red. He says, scarlet were the clothes she wore. 
that's so much of a better composition. Hmm. Everybody knows, I'm sure. In other words, everybody knows. Scarlet, you know, is the color of betrayal. The scarlet letter, a scarlet woman, uh, you know, you, it's always I'm going to be betrayed by the scarlet woman. Well, hmm. Everybody knows, I'm sure, you know, they're all laughing at me, just like he says, and you can't do that. Everybody's green because I'm the one that won your love. But if they see you acting that way, they'll laugh in my face. And he's this girl who this girl wasn't true to him. She left him behind. She was unfaithful. Mm. And he is saying it in the most poetic way. Then fate plays a role because he's getting ready to play it to record it with his Gibson 160E and his string breaks. And when the string breaks, George says, well, you can use my Jose Ramirez. He's got two in the studio and we're not sure which one he used, um, but he uses this guitar with acoustic strings. It's very soft. It's very hushed. And it really adds to this ballad. You know, people will say, oh, John Lennon, he's the one that wrote the rocker songs. And then Paul wrote the ballads. Well, no, John wrote lots of ballads, beautiful ballads. Right. And this is one of them. And George using that tone pedal, um, that warping sound that is at the beginning of the song really almost sounds like it's like, ooh, ooh, like you're going back in time, going back to another day. And you're seeing the sadness of this man who is lost. He's lost this girl. And he doesn't even want you to wear the color she wore because it destroys him. And then, you know, this can be this, I, 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 I this could be just a song about a girl that he dated and lost. I don't know. But to me, when he gets to the part of I could be happy with you by my side if I could forget her. But that's my pride. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. And then he goes, yeah. It's just if you take the biography route, that song will break your heart. Because he can't be happy. I mean, I could be happy if I could just let this whole then go, but I can't let it go. And he, you hear the pain in his voice, the, the, that raw guttural pain. And to me, it's just, I almost can't listen to it because it's so, it, it just, to me, it's John revealed and um, love the song. It is, he's, he tries to act like he doesn't let anybody in. Like he, he'll say something rude to make you not like him to see if you back off or not. Mm -hmm. but he lets you in more than anybody I know. He's always letting people in. And once again, you're privy to his pain. And I just, I don't know. I love it. But I mean, how does it, do you like it? Do you not like oh, it? Yes, it is. Is one of the most underrated Beatles songs to me. I love dark songs. I like melancholy songs. <laughs> and yes, it is fits the bill in, in, in that category. Um, you know, I kind of wish that, uh, you know, I could never see it as a hit song, although to me, it certainly deserves it. It's kind of complicated in the harmonies there. There are different chords in there. They're not just typical chords. And the harmonies are wonderful. It's in the same category as Because or This Boy. And even John said, yes, it is, was like a rewrite of This Boy. Yeah. Didn't he say that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So that didn't help. A lot of people live by John's words. So then they they think the same way as John thought. And John was very critical of his own work. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you could be your own worst critic. And I think John was. At times, Paul is. So, um, yeah, I love Yes, It Is. I'm glad that's one of your top yeah. three. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. And, you know, you are right. And this next song is John hates this next song. <laughs> hates it because John does not like to be embarrassed. When he got married, he said being married is like walking around naked with socks on. To him, it was, it was humiliating. You know, uh -huh. he wants to be the stud, you know, I'm, I'm John Lennon, the man on the town. He, when he would call Mimi, he would say it's himself, you know, and being married is too docile for him. Well, this next song embarrassed the heck out of him. And any time that you hear John say, this song is no good, this song is 
useless. It's a terrible song. You need to listen to it because it's John telling too much about himself. He's given too much information. He does not want you to listen to it. And the third pick is it's only love. Um, hmm. So he said that, you know, it embarrasses him to hear it. Yeah, it definitely embarrasses him to hear it, but it's not because it's a bad song. It's a, it's a gorgeous song but it's because it is revealing what's going on in his life in the autumn of 1965. So when I went to see Lennon on Broadway, um, Cynthia wasn't even in it. She's not in, in the play at all. It went twice. I'm like, dude, I imagine this. She's not mentioned. Um, Yoko's in the whole second act, but there is no Cynthia. And people minimize the role of Cynthia Powell Lennon. She um, meets him in the autumn of 1958, right after Julia has been killed. He's a, he is a basket case and they start just being friends because they're in lettering class together and he, she does his homework and she also carries his favorite cigarettes, even though she doesn't smoke, Woodbine's embassies. And um, they start playing a game, what couldn't you see on the way to school today? Because they're both blind. And they start to be buddies and then they start to open up to each other. And she talks about the fact that her dad has died. And he talks about the fact that his mother has died. And they begin to bond together. By the by 1959, the end of term bash, he asked her to dance. You know the old story. They're dancing at first. She says they were dancing to, to No One Missed to Love Him by the Teddy Bears. And in her second book, she says they were dancing to a Chuck Berry rocker. So I don't know which one they're dancing to, huh. but they're dancing. And he says, you fancy going out with me then? And she's like, she's so head over heels and so scared of him and nervous. And she, well, I'm kind of engaged to someone else. And he kind of shoves her off and says, well, I didn't ask you to marry me. And I dead eye and storms out. And she follows him. And goes to Yee Crack and waits and waits and waits and waits and waits for him to notice her. And he doesn't because he's watching her in the mirror in front of him. She's behind him. And when she finally stands up to leave, he says to everyone in the place, didn't you know that Miss Powell's a nun then? And everybody starts laughing and she starts laughing and he swivels around, goes over to chat her up and they end up at Stu's place in Gambier Terrace making love for the first time. And they are together from then on. They are together 10 years. By the time that he writes this song, they are together six years. And the wheels are starting to come off the car. And because, unbeknownst to John, George, Patty, and Cynthia, they, at the end of March, I think it's the 27th of March, I was able to narrow it down by seeing what they did every single day. And when they had a night free that they could have gone somewhere they go to the home of George's dentist to have dinner and without asking their permission, who does this, what kind of a jerk does this, he puts LSD in their coffee and John is livid. You've given me drugs. You gave my wife drugs. You didn't ask us, but they leave. And he, the man tries to get them not to leave and to drive a car, but they do. And they go to Adelaide club and all this and the whole night long is a horrible 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 experience for Cynthia she tries to throw up she can't throw it up it keeps going and going and going it's not an hour-long trip it's not three hours it's hours and she is she thinks she's losing her mind John on the other hand can't feel the pain he's free from that agony and not only does he feel great but he is in another dimension. He envisions himself captaining a ship. He's in control. He's not sad. And he loves it. So the next day, she says to him, I'm not ever doing that again. And he said, oh, yeah, you got to. It, 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 it's everything. And she's like, it, no, I'm never doing it again. He talks her into trying it again, just as bad as the first time. He talks her into doing it a third time just as bad as the other two times she also feels like she has a child to raise she can't afford to be going out and taking drugs and that is the moment and she says it she says the biggest change in our lives and the biggest single factor that led to our breakup 
was John's deepening interest in drugs. This is on, in her book, John. It is the reason we drifted apart. Now, by 65, he is going out on the few nights that he has and taking drugs with, with people that will and bringing them home. She says he would bring home strangers. He didn't even know their last names. And sometimes they would stay for a couple of days in the house. And she was doing an art project that she really trained to be an art teacher. And then when she went to Hamburg and spent those time, that time with John over Easter, she did not study well enough. She did not pass her final exam to teach. But she still loves art. She's doing this project. And John comes home one night stone and gets stickers that say safe is milk. And he sticks them all over her art project. So she's just so torn up about it. And they are really having a tough time. Hmm. So when he sings It's Only Love, um, he's admitting a lot of things that he doesn't want the public to know which is, first of all, he's still in love with his wife. Yeah, I get high when I see, and and Cynthia said the song was about me. I get high when I see you go by. My, oh, my. Uh, you can just hear him saying that. You know, when you sigh, my heart inside just flies, butterflies. He's still in love with her. But what are we doing? Fighting every night. Is it right that we should fight every night when just the sight of you makes nighttime bright? And, why am I so shy when I'm beside you? Here's this posh, hoy lake girl about whom everybody at the art college said, you're too good for that linen. You shouldn't date that linen. He's not good enough. He, he's what my father used to call him. He's a hoodlum. Hmm. And you are Cynthia, Cynthia Powell and you should leave him alone but she doesn't. He's never felt like he measures up to her. And now he really doesn't feel like it. And they are on the outs. They are fighting all the time. So this song is so rubber soul because, you know, rubber soul is not about moon, June, croon, spoon. It is about complicated relationships. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is John telling you, here's my complicated relationship. And I think he regretted every ounce of his life that he put that out there for people to see that he, his marriage was falling apart. But um, man, when you listen to it, it's so hard loving you. What gets you more than that line? It's so hard loving you. And for people that have struggled in their marriage and have really, you love the person, but it just is so difficult I mean, that this is a real song. It it just really speaks to the heart. And it, it is Cynthia, Cynthia said it was the in her book, she said it's the only song that John ever wrote about me, which is not true. He wrote many other songs about her, but that's the one that she felt that he wrote about her, and that's sad. So when he expressed that he was not proud of this song, he was just covering up. I don't think he wants you to listen to it. And he does it with all the other songs. Any song just about that John says, don't listen, that song's crap, <laughs> go listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he certainly cut down Run For Your Life. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with the Run For Your Life. You know, I mean, in, in the 1950s and in the 60s, hmm. Under My Thumb, that was a huge hit for the Stones. As late as 1981, they're using it to open their concerts in, in Europe. And the, it's a huge hit. Hey, Joe, I shot my woman down. Nobody complained about that. Um, the little girl, what's her name? Is it Joni Summers? Who sings about Johnny get angry, Johnny get mad. Give me yeah. the biggest lecture I've ever had. No one got mad about that. They only when John Lennon says something do people gripe about it. And he's borrowing the line from Elvis. And yet, oh, yeah, that John Lennon is a misogynist. No, he's not. He's singing a rock and roll song. <laughs> you know, it's not a great song, but it's not him hating on women. So, you know. It's typical of a lot of songs like that. Yeah. There were plenty of them in the 50s and 60s. So, I don't know. It's like I said. He could be his own worst critic. Yes. And um, it's a shame because I've always enjoyed Run For Your Life. Yeah. 
Anyway, um, let's move on to the next of the categories, top three solo Lennon studio albums. Well, I, 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 um, this was really, really, really difficult. Um, because I, I, I said to Al Sussman one time, well, I, I'm a Lennon fan and I like John's catalog better than I do the catalog of the Beatles. And he's like, and it, so he leaves and he comes back like an hour later and he's like, I got a bone to pick with you. And I said, okay. And he goes, did you just tell me that you like the Lennon catalog better than the Beatles? And I said, yeah. How can you say that? And I said, well, okay. Mind games, instant karma, give peace a chance. Beautiful boy, woman starting over not to mention the ones that I picked hmm. um he, he was a great songwriter he was a great balladeer he was a great rocker he was he wrote earworms that you can't get out of your head is some of the songs like let's take Attica State for example don't ever play Attica State fair warning you play it you will hear it over and over and over and hmm. over you can't get it out of your head Right. Uh, well, 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 John Sinclair, he has, he's great at earworms and at slogans and at, he's great with protest songs. So I, I love his, and this was really, really difficult, but um, my number three choice is Plastic on a Band. Um, it is obviously because I am so into the biography it's the result of that Arthur Janov primal screen therapy. And you see John on this LP starting to heal. I mean, he's trying, he's trying very hard to come to grips with all this stuff that's been haunting him for years. And the songs that are on there, um, I, here's that quote that I was, that I was um, talking about a little bit earlier, Ken. This is Arthur Janov saying when, when he hears John's album, He's interviewed about it because John's very forthcoming about the fact that he's had primal screen therapy and someone interviews him and Janov says the level of John's pain was enormous. He was almost completely non-functional. Mm -hmm. He couldn't leave the house. He would hardly leave his room. This was someone the whole world adored and it didn't change a thing. At the center of all that fame and wealth and adulation was just a lonely little kid. And that's what we get on Plastic Ono Band. And I love the people that work with him on this. You couldn't have more lifelong friends than he chooses because Ringo's with him. Right. Klaus right. Foreman is with him. Phil Spector. You know, Phil Spector, I don't know how he did it, but he wormed his way onto the plane to be with the Beatles when they go on their first trip to America. Yeah, he's been with him for a long time. And so um, the LP, when it came out, got mixed reviews. And I don't think it's because the album is bad. I think it's because people were pissed off at John. They did not like Yoko at this point. They thought that he'd made a big mistake. And they some people were prejudiced. Some of it was about race, you know, and some of it was about she's weird. I mean, what is the stuff that she's singing and what is she getting him to do? And why is he appearing naked on the cover of a LP? And why are they putting acorns in a bag? And they're just weird. That's all there is to it. So that's part of it. Part of it. So the is, fact that, that John was kind of forcing Yoko on everybody because everything he did was with her. Yep. That's right. Yeah. And it's him, not her. It's him. Yeah. Because, you know, when she, he tells her, I think you and I talked about this, when he tells her, you have to serve me, all of the women in my life serve me, Mimi did, Cynthia did, and she goes, okay, there's only one thing for it, I'm leaving, <laughs> you know, and then he's like, oh, no, 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 <laughs> no, and so then he's taking her everywhere with him. Let's go to the bathroom together and let's, mm. you know, I mean, he's not going to let go. You won't leave me, will you? There it is. But um, so I think the reaction to this album is more 
the fact that people are mad at John and they want him to be a Beatle and they want him to go back to doing what he used to do. And we don't like this, what you're doing than it is about the song. But um, I think God, which you and Andy discussed so brilliantly, um, is one of his greatest songs ever. So he's, he's taking this method of healing, which is called Cartesian philosophy for people out there. Rene Descartes, was a philosophe um, in France. It's not a philosopher, really. It's just a person who is a great thinker. They're not really trained in philosophy, but he was a thinker. And he felt like you could heal yourself if you would sit down and make a list of everything that you used to put your faith in that you found to be useless, that doesn't work for you anymore. Hmm. Then you made a list of everything you could still believe in And then you took your focus away from that stuff that failed you. And you only put your focus on what what really matters in your life and what you can believe in. And it's interesting that John categorizes them. He's got heroes. So heroes, you've got Bob Dylan, you've got Elvis, and you've got the Beatles. Those were the heroes he thought Mm -hmm. he could trust. They all failed him. Faith systems, he's got magic, I Ching, tarot, the Bible, Buddha, Gita, in other words, I'm throwing it all out. I'm throwing it. I don't believe in any of it anymore. World leaders, Kennedy, I'm sure he thought they, the Beatles were playing a gig the night that Kennedy was killed and they were all just destroyed. And he he couldn't get over it when he and Art Shriver, because Art covered the Kennedy assassination, toured together, John would say, why did it happen? What happened? They didn't want to go to Dallas. They they were very Kennedy-focused kings. Um, they go to Buckingham Palace for the investiture, and John is acting like he doesn't want to go because, you know, he's not establishment. He's too cool for school, and he's not going to do that. And he's a gog at the palace. He loves it, the music that's playing, and it's so beautiful, and all of the pomp, and and the queen is so nice to him, and and he's so uh, nervous that he can't even remember. They're making rubber sole, and she says, what have you been doing lately? And he goes, uh, we been on holiday because he can't even think of what they're doing he's a gog Hmm. he he puts his faith in kings but not anymore and hitler you know he certainly doesn't put his faith in hitler so he he's throwing it all out what do i believe in well in the first recording of it he says i just believe in me i don't imagine that played too well at home that night (laughs) so so he re-records it yoko and me yeah, I can see that that whole scenario. Oh, so you just believe in yourself. Um, but that I have thought about that God is concept line for years and years and years trying to understand it. And the only and I don't know, I, I want to hear what you think, Ken, because to me, the only thing I can think of is if God equals love, and if God equals peace, then that's the measuring stick and whatever we're experiencing is measured by that it's a concept by which we can measure our pain i don't know what do you, i mean do you what do you get from that line i kind of feel like when he's saying that if certain things in your life didn't come out the way that you planned even yeah. if you do believe in god yeah then you blame it on god Yes. You know, that's true. I hadn't thought about it. I mean, like, what is he saying there? Yeah. And certainly I bet he did. Well, he did. We know because there's that scene when he's on the floor of the bathroom in Kenwood and he's crying and he Mm. says, you know, if God, if you're there, what, you know, what the is going on? Um, Tell me what you want me to do, because I don't know. You know, I don't know what you want me to do. So it's just a very um, self-examining song. uh, And the vocals are incredible. And the production of the song is really pared down so that the vocals are front and center. And a lot of people, when it was released, said it was egotistical, that, you know, it's all about Joe. John's just talking about himself. But he's struggling. He's trying to come to terms with 
the loss of the one thing he believed in, the one thing that he thought was real was the Beatles. He thought he, when he lost Julia, he started carrying that guitar on his back all the time. He always had that guitar with him. And he believed that if he could just sing songs and write songs and live <clears throat> rock and roll and his music, he would be saved, but it didn't save him. In fact, it fell apart. Well, he like, realized there was more to life than fame. Right. You know, and having a relationship, having someone that you can, that you want to spend the rest of your life with, that you want yeah. to share all of your thoughts and feelings and your most intimate uh, feelings with somebody else for the yeah. rest of your life. That's more powerful than anything else. That's right. That's what he experienced at the time. So, you know, I think he very willingly said Yoko and me, and that's reality. Yeah. So um, it's it's probably one of the bravest things anyone could have ever said in a song. Yeah. To just basically say all the people that I've worshipped and idolized really don't mean all that much. And I've come to realize that. And this person that I'm sharing my life with, that's what matters. That's right. That's the person that's right in front of me. That's the person that I'm going to you know, spend every day of the rest of my life with, there's nothing stronger than that relationship. And that's something that hopefully you can control. You have no control of what other people do to you. But, you know, when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, that's a relationship where both people affect everything that they do for the rest of their lives. And, okay. you know, <laughs> there's a lot of people who are in the entertainment field that never realize that. That's right. You know, everybody has to experience for themselves what's really more important. For some people, it's their careers. For other people, it's their family. And for John, when he settled down the last five years of his life and he spent it raising Sean, spending more time with Yoko, even though Yoko did the business part of their relationship, you know, he realized he was very satisfied with that life and he had already accomplished as much, you know, to satisfy himself creatively. Of course, he's always going to be creative <laughs> and he could have kept on making more and more albums. And you know that and probably had more and more success, but it wouldn't have mattered as much because he had already achieved that anyway. He didn't have to prove anything to himself. And he had Yoko and Sean. Yeah. 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 It's just, you know, too sad, but it, at least he reached a state of happiness was really excited about touring in the spring and he you know they he had great plans and he was going to make another record and we, he left here a very happy man a very mm. peaceful man he had found a place where he was happy and that didn't think that would ever happen but it did so you know i agree with you and, and really to me i could be totally off base on this but to me i found out is just about the same song. I found out, you know, what's real. And mm -hmm. it's none of these false prophets and false gods. I found out what matters. And it it's kind of God, but vamped up, it, you know, a little bit heavier, a little bit angrier, a little bit more in the rock vein, but it's kind of the same sort of song. But I like it too. Right. Um, the, other, the one song I really love is Working Class Hero. And I just get so upset when I hear people say, well, John Lennon, he, I don't know why he thought he was a hero, calling himself a hero. At a, he's not working class either. Okay, hello, everybody. It's irony. It's sarcasm. He's rolling his eyes. I know you can't see him, but he's saying, I'm not a hero. I'm, if I'm anything but that, I've been tortured all my life. I don't know what I wanted to be. They tortured me in school. They told me to follow the rules. But if I followed the rules, and if you're smart, they hate you and they hit you. And I, I invested in this career and it proved to be false. <laughs> A working class hero is something to me. He's being sarcastic. Mm -hmm. And he's not saying he's a hero. He's saying I'm a loser and I'm not what I appear to be. You know, Another it's a way of saying it. Yeah. And, but, the he had so much pressure put on him because he was the only boy in the Stanley family and they told him that over and over and over you're expected to do great things then his mother says and she's trying to inspire him and to give him something to cling to now that George is gone 
you have music in your bones. You're destined to be great. Well, that's very inspiring, but it's also pressure. And then he's he knows he can draw, he can write, he writes very great prose and poetry. He can write songs. He's very musically inclined. He's got all these talents and to much whom to to the person to whom much is given, much is to be expected. So he's got all these expectations on him. And he's saying in this song, it's all too much. It's all a sham. They, they make me feel like I have to live up to all their expectations and I can't. And so, you know, it is just to me, it is him once again telling you, I may not live up to all the expectations. I'm just John. I'm just John, you know such a I mean, working class hero classic and i have to admit i love when mark hudson used to do it at the fest for beatles fans i was that girl he stood on the stage and said i wasn't going to do this this year but this girl comes up to me and says you're doing working class hero right that was me. oh that was you all that time <laughs> I'm in trouble. I love, I love uh, the line in the song. They hate you if you're if you're clever, and they despise a fool. That's right. You can't win no matter how That's you right. come across. That's right. You know, and people. It's so funny because people always say they like winners, and if you don't win, if you're a football team and you're not winning, especially if you're not doing well at all, they boo you. Oh, thanks for being so loyal. Thanks for the loyalty. Yeah, uh -huh. they boo you. But the minute that you win the Super Bowl two or three times, you're like, I can't stand them anymore. You know, <laughs> I mean, it just they got it, it, you're damned if you do and if you don't. So, and he knew right. that. Um, anyway, I, just just uh, to add to this, Plastic Ono Band is is usually looked upon as being his greatest album. Yeah. Now it is. Yeah. By the critics, and I think that it was big. He got really great reviews from what I remember when it first came out. It's yeah. a difficult album to take because he's bearing his soul to right. the world. You know, it's um, what what makes this album work is not just the fact that the songs are great, even though I always say the song's more important than the production, but the fact that it's so stripped down, yes. it makes what he's singing even more personal. Yeah. You hear his voice more. It really stands out. There's no real polish. There's no orchestration. It's just him, his voice some guitar and drums maybe some piano um and when you're when you apply that approach it just makes the songs even more deep yeah. you know and interesting and you know like very personal yeah even my mummy's dead yeah you know i mean 40 seconds just him and here here's the here's the heart of the matter you want to know the heart of the matter here it is yeah it's just out there um, the one I think that's different on the on the album is Hold On, because it again, it's kind of like there's a place to me. It's got hope. He's saying, and in, in spite of all of this, I've just told you about Hold On. And in 2020, I, mean, I didn't go the, out of the house for two years because I, I went out of the house to run and I got near no one, but I didn't go to a store. I didn't go to anything for two years because I have so many autoimmune diseases. And I almost, it, being separated from people for two years is a terrible thing. And hold on, got me through it because I kept hearing it's going to be all right you know, we're going to win the fight. It's going to, we're, this is going to go away. And it did, but it is such, it, I think it's underrated as such a powerful image of hope in dark times. Mm -hmm. It's a great song, but. Oh, definitely. So. All right. So that is. That's one you know, of the three albums. Yeah, the next one, of course, is Imagine. Um, not so much because of Imagine. I'm not a fan of Imagine. Um, and I heard you say the other day, it's been played so many times that, that may have something to do with it. Hmm. Uh, it, it partially, but I, I, it does not, um, we all have belief systems and we all have things that are important to us. 
And I don't want to imagine a world in which there's no heaven. Um, that's important to me. Mm -hmm. And I, it just isn't a song that appeals to me personally. Um, and the fact that it represents John when there's so many great songs that he wrote that could represent him, but you know, that's what other people like. Great, wonderful. It's just, it's my least favorite of his songs. Um, that's really interesting. You know, it usually rates way up there, yeah. but I think if it doesn't rate highly, there is the fatigue factor. I really yeah. do believe that because it's used in for so many causes. You know, it's a song that Yoko has pushed a lot of all the songs from John Solo Cannon. That's the one she always picks. And it uh, it obviously resonates with a lot of people. So, you know, all the power to them. Yeah. If they love it. And I love the song, too. It could probably there's there's some people who who may disagree with imagine no religion. Yeah, you know, I mean, some people probably have a lot of you know difficulty accepting that. So you know, so you know, to me that is that's what gets me through the night and the day. <laughs> and so I don't want to imagine that. And if that's what John wanted to imagine, great. And anybody else, great. But it's it's the song is not for me. Hmm. Um, but I love the other songs that are on there. Um, and I think like, I don't want to be a soldier is, um, a really underrated song that he is, he is singing for so many people in 1971 at the end of the Vietnam war and the trauma. So many of my friends, brothers did not come back from Vietnam or they came back completely changed people. And, He's he is speaking out for so many of those young men that were really struggling. Um, jealous guy. Oh my gosh. John got into this thing in the late 60s and the and throughout the 70s in Ken Womack's wonderful book, John Lennon 1980. You follow the growth of songs from their inception to their production. And he was spending two to eight years writing a song. It, it didn't happen overnight and it didn't have to happen overnight. So he really let a song mature. And when you think about this starting as child of nature and then maturing into jealous guy, what a transformation. Hmm. Jealous guy is another of his confessional songs, but it is um, so well honed and it is, it's him speaking his heart again, singing his heart again, but it is done with so much attention to detail and the lyrics are great. And it's, it's just such a good song. Same thing with Crippled Inside. Now he does that to that Tin Pan Alley, jaunty, almost, almost has a country Western flavor, but he's still dissing on John Lennon. The one mm -hmm. thing you can't hide is when you're crippled inside. Yeah. You, know, you think I can wear a suit and I can look real cute and I can, smile on the cover of life magazine but look i can't hide it i'm crippled inside hmm. and he's out there telling you his story again and he kind of does it a la help because his original version of help was very melodic very much a ballad very quiet very hushed and george martin said you can't do that sorry it's going to be the lead song for the movie we can't have it start with a sad song it's got to be zippy peppy and bursting with love <laughs> and um so they did it that way and so people don't even know it's a sad song they're like what help yeah mm. you know that's when i was younger no it's a sad song and so it's crippled inside but it's done so upbeat you know same sort of thing um how do you sleep look <laughs> <laughs> here's the deal someone it, well, Paul throws out the gauntlet in too many people. Yeah, okay. He probably could have gotten over that. But taking the photos of um, Linda and himself in the clown suit, in the bag, and putting it in the magazines, and then you expect John Lennon not to come back at you. He's like Donald Trump in that aspect that Donald Trump cannot not retort to someone. He cannot make himself not do it. Mm hmm I'm sure his wife has said to him a million times, shutty, you know, do not 
call someone a name. Do not retort to them. If they say something, shut it. And John can't help himself. So he's going to get back at him. And, and I can see why his feelings were hurt. And he comes back with both barrels. And it, it, it's a pretty good song. So, you know, <laughs> it's not a nice song. Not at all. No, but it's, you know, it is, uh, it's a good song. Um, How, oh my gosh, one of the best songs he ever wrote. Oh, thank you. Ever. So underrated. You yeah. know, nobody ever points to that one. Yeah. Really. Actually, there's, um, well, you were just watching uh, Talk More Talk. Um, yeah. And we were discussing Rolling Stones top 100 solo Beatles songs and how was all the way at the bottom there. I'm just glad that it was anywhere in there, but it deserves to be way up higher. You yeah. know, by the way, getting back to how do you sleep? You know that John read into a lot of stuff from Paul. Like he thought Dear Boy was about was about him. Yeah. And it wasn't. Yeah. Um and uh, backseat of my car, we believe that we can't be wrong. He thought that that was about him and Yoko. Paul, at the time, to the best of my knowledge, never admitted that too many people was about him and Yoko. He did later on, but there's no escaping the cover of Ram with two Beatles on there, on yeah. the back, and what they were doing. So yeah, I mean, John had his reasons to to suspect, but. He kind of overdid it when it came to the songs. Yeah, and maybe. I mean, I don't know. I know when you're mad, you just, yeah, he put it out there. But if it had not been about Paul, we would have liked the song. You know, it's a good song. Well, John, John said, as a piece of music, it's a good, it's a yeah. good piece of work. You know, yeah. you know so... I don't know. I mean, there's so many. I mean, we could go. Oh, Yoko, love Oh Yoko. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. So, I mean, I. It's kind of an earworm because, like, all night long, I heard it in my head, and it's. It really imagine is. Um, it is just a strong, strong. We even got to give me some truth, which is great blank verse again, and narrow-minded, hypocritic, neurotic, psychotic. It's, it is so good hmm. and it's strong and it's relevant today. If we could sing it today, it could be a huge hit yeah. is what's going on. Um, I just, it, I think all of Imagine is the only song I really don't like on there besides Imagine is it's so hard. It's not one of my favorites, but. Oh. It's a simple blues rock song. Yeah. I like his voice. I like the way he performs it. Uh huh. But I don't think it's as, as well written. I don't think the lyrics are as strong. But uh, it's funny because um, imagine the album is a transition towards some kind of New York City because he divides it between personal songs like Jealous Guy, Crippled Inside, Oh Yoko. You got personal songs and then you've got political songs. Mm hmm got imagine and I don't want to be a soldier and give me some truth so he's moving toward what's going to be his next project he's starting right. to be more political which brings me to choice number three which is number one really yes I am obsessed with it I it is my by far favorite LP I love sometime in New York City wow that's very I I'm fascinated with someone with a different opinion. Yeah. So tell me why. Okay. So I love the concept. Um, it's the front page of a newspaper. And instead of being the New York Times, it is some time in New York City. Here are all of the things that matter. And I know you won't remember them if I just talk to you about them. That's what John's saying. But if I sing them to you, it's going to make an impact. And you're going to hear these things and they're going to stick in your head and you're going to want to do something about it. So I have a hard time with math. I mean, I am the worst at math of anyone in the world. And I didn't think I was going to be able to learn my multiplication tables. And so my father got me these records, these 45s that I could play. And they were the multiplication tables set to music. Two times two is four. Boom. Two times two is four. And so I learned them. <laughs> still remember it because of those records. 
And John is gonna is going to tell us, John and Yoko, about the things that are important in the day, and he's gonna set them to music. And then we are going to know about them, sing about them, remember them, and hopefully do something about them. And of course, the cover is the newspaper, the page of the newspaper. It's so clever. And he chooses this rough and ready bar band. Um, the Plastic Ono Band is made up of these great raw musicians, these bar musicians who are so powerful. Stan Bronstein on the saxophone, who can make that saxophone wail. And Tex Gabriel, oh my gosh, his lead guitar work is mm out of the room it's so great and um you've got jim keltner at parts and andy white at parts and you've got uh um what is the guy junior what is the guy that drum for him let's see uh well we'll get to it but he <laughs> they have another drummer who is just incredible do you remember the drummer's name i'm Kurt trying to remember it will probably come to me <laughs> Um, I, I've got it written down, but he is he is incredible. And Gary Van Syak, I'm sure you've had Gary. Yeah, he's a good friend. Yeah, he Gary's bass is so different from Paul's bass. Paul, to me, sometimes uses his bass as a as a lead guitar. A lot of times he's playing lead line on the bass. He doesn't just boom 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 boom. boom. Yeah, Gary is providing this hard thumping heartbeat kind of bass um oh my gosh they are it's it's just a great great raw album and it's full of hooks uh we talked about attica state if you hear it you can't forget it um it's got earworms it's got things to make you listen for example at the beginning of sunday bloody sunday you hear the sound of marching feet and um, John's loaded it up with things to make it memorable. So I love it. Um, I think he made a mistake with the first song. He, to me, should have made New York City the first song because everything that happens on the album is happening in New York City. It is um, all the all his usual suspects, Jerry Rubin, David Peel, Frank Zappa, they're all hanging out at Max's Kansas City. Mm. He and Yoko are riding their bikes through um, the village. They are, it's, he should have set the scene and put New York City, here's where it's going to take place. And now here are the things that are happening. That should have been, and he, he had planned to do it as the first song, but Woman is the End of the World was so important to him and it mattered so much to him that he decided to make it the first song. And it doesn't really fit as the first song, but I understand that it meant everything to him. So my rant on Woman is the End of the World is, is so stupid beyond belief that we can't say the title because I am a huge top 40 addict. I mm -hmm. love, I listen to top 40 all the time. And I drove back from Dallas the other day three hour drive. And I made a, a marking of every time that I heard the word in song on today's songs. Yeah. Like 24 times. And so we can, we can do it. We can say it today. It's all over airplay, all over airplay. Mm -hmm. and yet when John Lennon says it, you can't say it. And he was worried about it. He, he got in touch with Ron Dellums, who was the head of the black caucus. And he said, um, I got Ron's quote. He said to Ron, can I say this or is this going to be offensive? And Ron immediately got in touch with him and said, oh, you absolutely need to say it. And this is Ron's quote. If you define in as someone whose lifestyle is defined by others, whose opportunities are defined by others, whose role in society is defined by others, the good news is, being sarcastic, you don't have to be black to be an in in this world, the politician remarked. Most people in America are ends. And he also got in touch with the NAACP and wanted to know, is this going to be offensive? Absolutely not. We get what you're saying. Women are being treated the way we were treated for decades and decades and decades and decades. And 
you're right to speak out and we're behind you. So he did. Wasn't he, this on uh, the Mike Douglas show? Was it Mike Douglas or Dick Cabot? Which one? Yes. I forgot. <laughs> and Mike Douglas. And yeah. he's, you know, he, it's Yoko's phrase that he asked to borrow. And he thinks it's so clever. And it is. And it is very graphically telling you women are, it's not just that they're not being paid the same amount. That's not the point. The point is we make them sing and dance. We make them, you know, and if they won't bear our children and they want to be a boss or a leader, we say they're trying to be a man. And it, he lays it out for you. And this is John Lennon who mm. said in Atlantic City when a bunch of girls were in the room and they were talking and he was trying to watch TV, women are to be obscene and not heard. That's right. You know, and he, he definitely thought Cynthia was a second class citizen and he just... He's come a long way, baby. And he's singing this great song. It is one of his best vocals. I almost chose it as best vocal, but I didn't. And it is so memorable. And um, I just think it, it, and that's why he wants to put it first because it matters to it. He's a Northern man who's learned. Yeah, you know? it just goes to show you that there are certain songs where people don't take the time to really read the lyrics to know what the artist is saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, you just mentioned working class hero yeah. <laughs> and John's not saying he is a working yeah. class hero, Yeah, you know, um, and it makes me think about all in the family. Yeah, because there was a big uproar when that show first came on television and people thought, oh, it's promoting prejudice. No, it's not. It's making fun of it. <laughs> right. You know, right. same thing with Archie Bunker. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 I mean, oh, you're saying all in the family. I don't know why I was thinking Roseanne. Yes, all in the family. Absolutely. It was it was a, a spoof. It was Mad Magazine. You know? Yeah, yeah. definitely. definitely. so many times that Archie Bunker made a fool of himself, you yeah. know? And yeah. that's what it showed on, on, on the program. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I love John Sinclair. You know, this guy that's arrested for doing virtually nothing. And John is saying having marijuana is no reason that you should be locked up for mm -hmm. several years. I mean, this is ridiculous. Right. And, um, it is such an ear. It's the best earworm there is. You can't <laughs> forget it. You can't stop singing it. Got to, got to, got to, got to. That's John Lennon, you know, right. that know oh, him. Same thing with Attica State. You know, they had the, the riot and, um, it, it turns out to be a bloody mess. And he's he's asking us to be aware of prison reform. And prison, Attica State was not a good place to be. I mean, you know, it, it was not what Attica is today. It was a very gruesome place. Mm. And, you know, he's, he's doing it like a cheerleading song. Attica State, Attica State. You can just kind of dance along to it. It gets in your head. And he's, he's advocating for prison reform. Uh, I'm not going to talk about Sunday Bloody Sunday because it might be one in my top <laughs> of the vocals, but uh, Luck of the Irish. I heard you say this the other day. On Sometime in New York City, Yoko's vocals are so good. They mm. are so good. Uh, on Luck of the Irish, she rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed that, and it's really pretty. On Sisters, Oh Sister, beautiful but nothing is as good as angela um mm. it, only, it almost brings me to tears yeah but angela they put you in prison i mean yeah just because you associated with people that the government didn't agree with even though you did nothing wrong she shouldn't have run but she would have been in prison before she was in prison but just because you associate it with questionable people, they put you in prison. And they, this was a lecturer, a college lecturer who was respected and who had a life and it was basically taken away from her. This whole album is about injustice and treating people the way they deserve to be treated and trying to change our world to make it a better place. And that's what we're all about today. But John was a little bit too early. And um, I just, I, I love everything about the album. I love the slow, soft, gentle songs. 
I love New York City. I love Woman is the End of the World. I, I love it. Not as much as I love Sunday Bloody Sunday. <laughs> but, uh, it's a great, it's, to me, it's great. I mean, I don't understand why people don't like it. T tell me why people don't like it. Well, as much as I hate bringing this up, <laughs> it's going to become a mantra on my shows. But I'm always hearing when people judge music, whether it's songs or albums, how they don't like music that's dated. Oh. And this album tells you exactly what was going on in 1972. Yeah. You know, and so what? <laughs> yeah. You know, whether it's the subject matter that's dated, whether uh, it's the sound of the production that's dated, a lot of people are affected by that. Uh, you know, and, uh, well, I, I, I want to make sure I don't forget to bring this up. I know I asked Elliot Mintz this question, but, you know, at the end of his life, John said that that was his phony radicalism period. Yeah, and there, and there you go again, you know. So, yeah, that's how much he changes. But yeah. John did what he wanted to in his heart in that moment. Yes. You know, yeah. he was honest with himself at that moment. This is what he felt like writing. And then when he saw the backlash and that the fact that the album bombed then he went and did mind games yeah. which is more a return to the imagine sound that, that kind of feel to a, a john lennon album a more commercial album yeah. so how do you feel about what john said then right before he died are you just okay. going to say, well, you know, that's how he felt then? That's the way that I take everything else that he says. If he says it on a Tuesday, he may not believe it on a Thursday. I uh -huh. mean, you know, I don't. I, I just think that he has reasons for saying things and if and he'll say them like, don't listen to it. It's, it's only love is crap. Uh, he has a reason for saying that. I, I don't know that he believes it i don't know that he believes it was his phony i don't think john lennon was ever phony a day in his life he's mm. been a little bit more phony sometimes and uh been a little bit easier to get along with but he wasn't he said what he thought and so i believe he believed that that day when he said it but maybe not the next day <laughs> <laughs> and what about this whole concept of music being dated like this yeah. is a period piece i hear that i oh. never thought about that you know, I mean, yes, it is. I guess it's better if you write a song about something that's timeless. I, I hear that, but I just love the song so much that I don't think about the fact that it it's dated. I mean, I love music from the 1920s. Uh, We're in the money and the songs like that, that really sound dated. I mean, they're recorded like gramophone kind of thing. Um, uh -huh. And I love that music. And I love the music of the 40s about the, you know, you belong to me and the, and the world is waiting for the sunshine and about coming home from war. And, you know, I'll see you when the war is over. And mm -hmm. the, uh, what is it over the white cliffs of Dover? Right. You know, uh, I love all those songs. Um, so I don't, I, I guess I don't think about doo-wop of the 1950s sounds dated, doesn't it? The it was undated, but if I like it, I like it. It yeah. doesn't matter. It's it's yeah. it's how I feel inside of my heart that matters. Right. Not, you know, how much the production is right. different from that time. If it works for me, if it affects me, yeah. especially in a visceral way. Right. You know, who is someone to take that away from me? But right. I think I feel sometimes like, you know, we're brainwashed in the way that we're thinking now that the only yeah. music that's worth listening to has to be something that sounds like it's contemporary yeah and that's it weird fresh, you know in 2023 2022 2023 the music of that year was almost as diverse as 1965 there were songs that were disco pure disco songs mm -hmm. bruno mars for example it was very disco that year there were songs that were really 1960s. They sounded a lot like the early 60s, almost like a Mersey Beat sound. There was rap. Country and Western was hot on the charts in 20, 22, 23. It was, it was a flashback to every decade and it was all popular. So I don't 
I don't know. I, I don't really, I, I hear what people are saying when they say that, but to me, sometime in New York City is alive and kicking. <laughs> okay. Hey, I, I love the album. I do. It's just that I love the other albums from John Moore. <laughs> Maybe not rock and roll, but of the stuff that's his original stuff, I think Mind Games and Walls and Bridges were so underrated. Well, Walls and Bridges, I think, is respected. But now I hope Mind Games with the box set coming out. Yes. I hope that will elevate its status a bit and people yeah. recognize there's a lot of great songs on mind games. Yeah. But um, yeah. And and one of the great things about Sometime in New York City, I really do like Yoko's songs on there. I like a lot of Yoko's stuff on her own, own albums, but um, there's some really cool stuff from her, especially Born in a Prison, which has, you know, a real jazz feel to it. Yeah. Sisters of Sisters sounds like a Ronette song to me. <laughs> It, I mean, she worked really hard on her songs, yeah. and um, that when she and John sing together, it's it's magical. Yeah. I mean, they they do a great job. Luck yeah. of the Irish is is really pretty. And well, Angela, actually, you mentioned Angela. I mean, the two of them blending together so well vocally on that song, yeah, makes it very special to me. It really, really is good. And I this made me think I've never, ever, ever had to think this hard for so long I was like am I gonna make it <laughs> because I'm gonna collapse I have really worked because it's you've asked difficult things it is difficult to come up with your three John Lennon top solo LPs it is difficult to come up with his best vocals because the vocals are amazing mm -hmm. so um it's it was tough well we're gonna get to that next but before we do since you since you mentioned Al Sussman and the way that he felt about what you said, that you prefer John Solo stuff over his Beatles stuff. In the course of all the years that I've been doing my work on the Beatles, I've had people come up to me and say, I like John Moore as a solo artist of the Beatles. I like Paul Moore as a solo artist. I've never heard anybody ever say, I like the whole solo catalog better than the Beatles catalog. But they'll pinpoint one Beatle and say, well, I prefer him better on his own. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with saying that. Yeah. You know, there are people who think the Beatles catalog is so perfect, which I happen to feel, <laughs> that you really can't say anything to diminish it. And some people feel like it's an insult if you say that. But it just goes to show that they continue to put out great stuff on their own. The Beatles catalog was once in a lifetime phenomenal. It was the only other thing that I can liken it to is the fact that um around the American, time of the American Civil War, Henry David Thoreau, Bronson Alcott, Louisa May Alcott, who's just a kid, um, Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, Margaret Sidney and who else? They're all living in the same town. They all mm. live in Concord together and they interact. That was a literary haven of genius. I mean, it was it was unequaled in literature. That never happened again. It never happened before or after. The Beatles, the magic of the four of them, it had to be the four of them. They're, they had a quality that continues to be relevant, fascinating, beautiful. It gives you goosebumps. It still gives you goosebumps. Mm -hmm. All I have to hear is the first few notes of a Beatles song, and I'm just my arms are covered in goosebumps. It is, it's, it's incredible. But for me to say I'm not a Lennon fan, I really am. I mean, all my favorite Beatles songs are Lennon songs and all my favorite Beatles albums are heavily John centric. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just, that's just who I am. Um, it doesn't mean I don't love the music of George and Paul. And I love Rico's music. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love all of it. But I, I just, you know, it, it's not dissing the Beatles at all. They are, There is no equivalent. Then there never will be again. Yeah, well, you know, we're all entitled to have our own opinions of what we yeah. like the most. And you've got yeah. people that like Paul more than the others. Some yeah. like George more than the others. That's how it is. That's the beauty of being a fan. There's always one of them that you can probably relate to the most, either as a person or musically, than the others. Yeah. 
and you can still love the others. Yeah. And in 1964, Ringo Buttons outsold the other Beatles combined hmm. times four. Times four. So there are a lot of people that loved Ringo. You know, I mean, he was extremely popular. Um, so, you know, it, it just it is a personal preference. But look, how lucky are we that we have an embarrassment of riches? Yes, we do. We can choose and we can love all of them and we can love them together. Um, in fact, you know, to me, because I am I love the Beatles as a stage band. I love the music of the Cavern and the Casbah, and Hamburg, and the BBC. And my favorite album is Live at the BBC, without a doubt. I couldn't use it on the show because I couldn't do any cover songs. Right. I, I made a list of my favorite ones, and it's Baby It's You, Twist and Shout, Soldier of Love, Mr. Moonlight, no John vocal is, is, even stands up to that, uh, Rock and Roll Music, Shot of Rhythm and Blues, I'll Be On My Way, and oh, Stand By Me. Mm. You know, so we are, we have an embarrassment of riches. We have so much that we can love. There's enough great music to last 10 lifetimes there. That's right. Probably more. <laughs> yeah. All right. Why don't we do the top three Lennon vocals of all time? Okay. Um, oh, it's right here. Hang on just a minute. I am looking for Gary Van Syok is going to beat my behind for not knowing his drummer gary i apologize maybe it's on the here somewhere but uh my number three song is new york city okay uh, it was the song that kind of saved me from the depths of depression when the beatles broke up and i thought we were gonna have no more beatles and then a lot of john's music sounded really different and i was adjusting to that new sound I mean, the songs that are on Plastic Ono Band sound nothing like the Beatles, nothing. And you know, then you come out with Imagine, and most of those songs don't sound a lot like the Beatles. Even the jaunty songs, even O Yoko, it, they don't sound like the Beatles. But then we get to this, and I was like, yes, there he is. That's that's John from the 1960s. That's the Beatle. That's the rocker. That's that's John back again, you know. Mm. And he's, He's really vamping it up and he's really, he, he, John has a voice. Um, George Martin said that he had a human voice and a, a lived in voice and that he, he is a, he is the voice of the people. He is out there and he's almost screaming it, but he's not screaming it. He's given it his all. And it took me on this whole magical trip of I'm living in a, teeny tiny town in North Louisiana, conservative North Louisiana. And I'm getting to go to Max's Kansas City and the Fillmore East and the Apollo and hang out with David Peel and Jerry Rubin and all these things that they're telling me in my little town is dangerous and taboo. And he's taken us through this New York City. It is uh, Tex Gabriel's guitar in that song is just smoking, and uh, the bass is great. John's mm -hmm. real gritty, and he it, he really always wanted something like he used to tell George Martin to put ketchup on his voice, ketchup or something, you know, do something with it. But um, Martin said he had, this is a quote from him, he had a distinctive lived-in untrained hardness it was the voice of someone who had lived and you hear it in this song. And I was like, yes, he's back. And my city that I always wanted to live in New York city is here. And to me, it was just, it's just a great song. Mm. Yeah. When I hear something like that song, it, it makes me think of because New York city is very Chuck Berry ish. Yes, it is. And I love Chuck Berry. So I think of say rock and roll music. Yes. Same kind of voice. Yes. Yeah. I love that. That is so true, you know, and that's why I don't really like um, the rock and roll album to me is John is too removed. It sounds, I guess it's, you would know, you can tell me why it sounds that way. I guess it's reverb. Is that what it is? It's so much reverb on the voice. Well, certain songs, there's, there's reverb. You can tell the Phil Spector songs that, yeah. that he left on there. Those have more reverb on them. 
the ones that he produced himself have less. They're more. Right. It's more of a pure sound. Although he always wanted reverb on his voice. Yeah. He was never happy with his voice. But um, no, it's definitely a little bit more buried. Yes. I, I shouldn't say buried because I, I love Sweet Little 16 on the album. And yet you can hear that there's some echo on there, some reverb on there. Right. Maybe that's what you're referring to on songs like those, but then at the same time, Bebopalula doesn't have it. It doesn't. It you doesn't. Know. Yeah, some of them don't. by me, doesn't it? You know, some of them are just too much. It reminded me. Shirley Bassey visited the boys backstage when they were at Carnegie Hall, and she said, "You know, she was talking about their sound, and she said, i 'I'm so loud that they keep backing me up from the microphone.' She goes, at one point, they had me standing in the hallway, and John, they're all laughing, you know, at, at her. And um, it to me, rock the rock and roll LP kind of sounds like John's in the hallway. And my husband said, "No, you know what it is." It's that John loved that sound of his voice when he was singing in his mother's shower at one Blomfield Road, all of that that was coming off the shower. And he's recreating that sound when he's a teenager. He's loving those songs. He's singing those songs with his mom. And this is recreating that echoey sound that they had in that shower. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, that's it. That's so it, you know, but- yeah. um, I well, like I like him up close and personal. It could be that, or it could just be that you know, he would tell he would tell the producer or the engineer mess up my voice, you know, do something with it. I know, you know, I know. He's well, very insecure about his voice, which is insane. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's definitely insane. So the, my next one you're going to think is uh, equally crazy, but it's Sunday Bloody Sunday, and um, there is, um. Songs appeal to us, obviously, because they speak to us personally. And they, you know, I am Irish. I am very much in, in favor of Irish freedom and independence. And um, every single book I read or listen to an audio book is about Ireland. I've Since the second grade, I told my teacher that I was going to Ireland. And she phoned my mother to say, I'm so excited y'all are going to Ireland. My mother said, we're not going to Ireland. Jude's trying to get us to go to Ireland. <laughs> and we're not going. We can't afford to go to Ireland. So I still haven't gone. But this story, the story behind Sunday Bloody Sunday, in a real short synopsis, is that in August of 1971, a law was passed for the UK that anyone suspected of terrorism could be arrested, not told why they were being arrested, and kept indefinitely without trial. It's called internment. And it went on through the fall of 1971. And in 1972, after church one Sunday in a little town called Derry, D-E-R-R-Y, um, there was a group of people who in their Sunday clothes, they had left mass, they were marching against internment. They had signs that they had painted. Right. You know, men in their Sunday suits, women, children, they didn't have guns, they're marching. And all of a sudden, the British forces, one para, the first battalion parachute regiment, opened fire on them. And um, they were, 13 people were killed, 11 more were seriously wounded, taken to the hospital, one of those died. And it's in the New York Times the next day, and John's reading it. And he says, most people express themselves by shouting or playing football at the weekend. But me, here I am in New York, and I hear about 13 people shot dead in Ireland, and I react immediately, and being what I am, I reacted forward to the bar with a guitar break in the middle. And he puts this song out, and it is um, Rick Frank Jr. is There playing. you go. Frank Jr. is playing the drums. Sorry. I, I had his last name, but I couldn't remember the first name. That's it. Stan yeah. Bronstein is wailing. Yeah. That sax is mournful. It is crying out in anger and in, in sadness. Yoko is keening the way that the Irish do when someone dies. They keen. They hire professional mourners to keen at the death. Um the drumming is incredible. This bass is so heavy. And at the beginning of the song, you hear the sound of these marching feet coming toward these people. And John's lyrics, and holding anything back. 
He says exactly what he thinks. It is authoritative. It's one of his most authoritative creations. And to me, it is on par with power to the people. Um, it's so memorable and it is just full of indignation for these deaths. And I, I mean, I absolutely love it. It's his cry for, for freedom and he's bold. He got banned by the BBC and from 1972 on every time he performed live, he was picketed by people that said that he was anti um, English and when I did, I did a webinar on uh, sometime in New York City, and when I talked about how much I love the song, I got so many ugly emails from people saying, "You're just an Irish rebel." Yeah, you, yes, I am. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the you for that. The only thing I question about that song is, and I love the song myself, and I have no problem with Yoko's vocals on there, but when it comes to the chorus, you hear more Yoko than you do John. Yeah. That's so you're true. picking this as a song for a Lennon vocal and uh, you yeah. Yeah, but I mean he does sing the rest of it. And right. I mean it was Sunday, bloody Sunday, when they shot the people. I mean, whoa. I mean, he is it's full of grit. It's powerful. Okay. And yeah, you can you can you can hear her a lot on there. But uh, again, I mean, if if when you're married two or one, he would they were definitely one, she's right there with him. Right. And I love her vocals on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good song. And the, with like Happy Christmas. Yes. You know, in the chorus, you you hear more Yoko than you do, John. Yes. And that's fine. Yeah. It works. I almost picked that too. That was a that was close in the running. And that one because I, you know, I'm a Christmas nut. And when yeah. We make it. We finally make. I get celebrate all of July. All of July, I watch Christmas movies and wear my Christmas pajamas and go through the whole thing. And then we finally make it to the holidays. And the first song I always play is "So This Is Christmas," and mm -hmm. it just it's emotional. It's, it has a whole emotional tie. I, this was very very difficult because I love all of the songs. So, but number one is. I'm losing you. Wow. The double fantasy version or the cheap trick version? Oh, well, I like what cheap trick does with it. They, I, I do like their version very, very much, but it's a double fantasy version. Um, and there's so many good songs on double fantasy. I mean, just like starting over amazing woman, amazing, beautiful. Mm. Amazing. It, they're, the whole album, but you're back to, the the gutsy raw lemon vocal and the story of the time that he's spending in bermuda and yoko is in the u.s and he's trying to get in touch with her and she won't answer the phone and then she tells him she's coming down and he gets flowers and he gets food and, and he gets all ready and then she doesn't show up and then he tries to call her why didn't you come and then she's it's not there and it people have condemned double fantasy because they say oh it's the lemons putting out this thing about how much they were in love and how perfect their lives were it's not no he's telling you right here they're having major trouble mm -hmm. these are major problems and then she does i'm moving on which again is full of venom so they're just like everybody they have good days and bad days and it's not this honeymoon it's it's dealing with real life and um i just i love the way he's honest about the fact that he is partially responsible for this here in some stranger's room late in the afternoon what am i doing here at all i mean he's telling you he's he's guilty but the rest of john's life and and i've read so many articles about children of divorce always kind of think in some remote corner of their mind that they had something to do with it, that hmm. maybe they're the cause of it. And he's got so much guilt and he does admit it at the beginning of the song. But then when he says, well, now you say you're not getting enough, but I remind you of all that bad, bad stuff. So what the hell am I supposed to do? Just stop and put a bandaid on it and stop the bleeding now. I mean, he's, finally getting mad and he's finally standing up for himself and saying i got the whole problem you're part of the problem right and it just everything of it's 
bluesy. I love the, the whole vibe of the song. Um, to me, it's it's his strongest solo offering. I mean, what do you think? It's one of them. <laughs> I mean, I, hey, look, I'm like you. I like just about everything that he's done in his solo career. When I think about vocals, there's the soft, tender vocals of John. Yes. I really like a lot, like on Julia. Yes. It's just so nice. And in my life is more straightforward, but it's, you know, a ballad. He's not forcing it's not a loud voice that he's doing he's not a screaming voice i love the guttural i love you know mother and and uh you know well 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 the screaming on well 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 and then for me a song like scared i oh, love his vocals I love that song. you know <laughs> i will don't bring up that song because i love um you don't have to suffer in, in heaven or hell. Just dance to the music. You do it so well, well, well. And it's going up high and strong. Oh, my God. It's His vocals are so perfect there. It's just, it's so much a part of the song. Yeah. The vocals are such a major instrument in, in John's music. And uh, the fact that he was as versatile as he was with his voice, that he could have so many different types of deliveries. Um, to me, he's he's definitely one of the greatest rock singers. Some people think he is the greatest, right. but uh, I, I always like to point to uh, to Scared as one that I like a lot. Um, yeah, Woman is the end of the world. Love his vocals on there. We make her paint her face and dance, and he's screaming at the end and holding a a long note. You know, uh, th there's so many of them. Old Turkey. I mean, yeah. you live the pain you are right there in that room with him i mean it is it, it, he can make you feel the pain he can make you feel the nostalgia looking back missing those people that aren't here he can he can make you feel the thrill i mean to me it's only love if you listen to that that's married love that is that's you still get chill bumps from that person but it's so hard loving you. It's so hard. You know, I mean, it's, there's just, he's just a master of taking what's happening to him and making you think it's about you. Like that man in Imagine that shows up at his house and says, mm -hmm. how'd you write all these songs about me? Yep. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of people that feel the same way as that guy. <laughs> yeah. That John was speaking to them, you know. And another magic that the Beatles had, because I really don't want people to walk away thinking, I don't love the Beatles. I love the Beatles. I wish you could see this room. All around me is nothing but Beatles. I absolutely love the Beatles. Um, but the one of the gifts that they gave us, besides the fact that we had a voice, that young people had a voice and we were allowed to speak. It wasn't children not seen and not heard, but we could talk and we could have opinions and we could strive to be great. And that, I mean, they gave us a million gifts, but one of the gifts that they gave us is that we were seen. People at the concerts, I've interviewed so many people who, who were at, like, let's say um, the Chicago concert in 1965. And they say, Paul looked right at me. He saw me. I, I waved to him and he waved back. And John looked right at me. I don't know that they looked at him. Yeah. But they thought they did. They connected. They found a way to connect with the struggles you're going through and with your happy days and with they they weren't i mean the stones weren't worried about connecting with you they were having a great old time with mm. you know uh, the things that were going on in their own world and i don't think herman's hermits were trying to connect personally with you the beatles were connecting with you well one of the things i mean the beatles are so separate from most of the other bands you know you've got bands where you have a lead singer and he's the one you focus on you never hear anything about the other band members right. the Beatles you knew John Paul George and Ringo you knew their names you had interviews with each of the four of them you got to know them as people right. so maybe you felt oh I can really connect with George the most I like that spiritual side of him I see where he's going here 
you know, uh, or you feel more connected to Paul or John or Ringo for some reason. So you you really came to know each of the four of them if you really studied them as people. And uh, it wasn't just one main singer or, or one main songwriter. And he did all the speaking for the band. You know, it was different with them. And, and it's something that I think is kind of overlooked in a way. Yeah. How many bands do you know each individual member where you can study them? You don't. Yeah. I mean, you really don't. I mean, Love and Spoonful, you know John Sebastian. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I love the Love and Spoonful, but who who else was in the group? Mm. You know, I mean, even we, we probably know more of the people in the Mersey groups because they affected the Beatles. I mean, in Jerry and the Pacemakers, we probably know more, but we don't know everyone in the searchers. I mean, you know more, but I, you don't connect with, with their life story and who they married and who their children are. And, you know, I mean, we, we are, we're in their business so much that they had to give, give it up. <laughs> They got tired of everybody being in their business. And certainly in the case of John and Yoko, and I've said this many times, they're so revealing about themselves. I know. You know, it's it's like when they give an interview, it's it's a plastic on old band album. <laughs> it's they're telling you what's on their minds, the struggles they're having as a marriage. Yep. You know, you feel like you're a psychiatrist or a psychologist when yep. they're talking sometimes. And it's it's almost like, you know. Sometimes you feel like you're telling me too much here. Yeah. You know? and, and, and I sometimes think John thought the same thing when it was over with. Like, why did I say that? Yeah. You know? Um, and, and the good thing about John is that sometimes when he says things that are hurtful and he doesn't mean them, he's the first person to say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. You right. know, he'll admit he was wrong. Yeah. That he, he shouldn't have said some of the things he said. But they are they are very out there in an interview they will give you all the details and um oh, one of my favorites in the david chef interview yoko's talking and she said well before i married and john goes john it's <laughs> <laughs> she just blanked <laughs> and then he just he goes into the whole history of from johan blah 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 blah, blah. Uh -huh. and just you know, but they're, they're real. They're really so real. And we're to, a, to have, I mean, I cannot tell you the hours I spent trying to sort this out because we have so much to choose from. And it's hard to pick three linen vocals. It's mm -hmm. hard to pick three of the best albums. It's hard to pick. There are so many Beatle quote unquote non hits that with any other group would have been number one. Oh yeah. Yeah, I've done a few shows here on my channel, songs that should have been singles. Yep. You know, and the Beatles as a group, my God, for all the hits they had, they could have had five times as much. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. You know, really and truly. And just I you can't thank someone for giving their life's work because that's what they chose to do and what they wanted to do. But they changed our lives. All of us, they changed mm. our lives. They are, of every event we ever did from the time that we were little kids until today, they are the backdrop. They are there. They changed the way we looked at things, the way we accepted things, the way we rationalized things and decided to move on. Well, this is what Paul did. Well, this is what John did. Well, this is how George saw that. This is what Ringo, Ringo was always steady and he didn't let things upset him and he kept moving on and he accepted the things the way they were. And they, they have been guiding us since we were little kids. They're all four distinct personalities. Yeah, they're all fascinating to study, you know, and um, you could understand, you know, how they got along and and in some ways why they broke up. Right. You know, enough is enough. I mean, they did it for a long time. They were anyone that says the Beatles were an overnight success doesn't know their history. 
no. they looked at it. I mean, here they are backing Janice the stripper and sleeping on the tabletop in Alan's club and covering up with a um, tablecloth. I mean, yeah, because they didn't have any money and Paul wasn't going home to Jim Mack and saying, I'm playing at the strip club downtown. You know, you just, they, they paid their dues. Absolutely. You know, and in a world where we've got, you know, American Idol winners, some of whom didn't pay their dues or they're singing at home in a mirror, yeah. you know, and not playing clubs and doing it for years and years and years and getting better and better and better at it. You know, the Beatles really earned, yeah, you know, the success that they had. They did. They did. Anyway, before we close here, I want to remind everybody um, since we're doing this show on April the 17th, 2024, I put that in there in case some people a year from now are going to be watching this. As we speak on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, I still have a copy of Jude's book, Shades of Life, Part 1, that you could win. And uh, her third book, She Loves You, is available as a prize as well as a PDF. Okay, so for those of you that love Beatles trivia, and I have it on my website, uh, at the moment we have a contest every two weeks. There's 10 prizes you can pick from, and two of the 10 are Jude's books. Yeah. So, uh, and by all means, please visit our website, johnlennonseries.com. You can see all the different titles of all of our books, and you can order them, and and it's always great having you here. Thank you so much. This, you really... Um made me grow because the music is not my wheelhouse. It's the biography. Mm -hmm. And I thought, am I going to be a chicken and not do this? Or am I going to put the pedal to the metal and really study these songs and, and really find out why I like them and what appeals to me and, and really learn. And I really felt like the last two or three weeks that I've been preparing for this I have really grown, and I thank you for challenging me to, to do something new. <laughs> okay, well, I'm glad you enjoyed this. And, you know, I grow from talking to my guests, too, so I can hear their opinions and their perspectives on everything. And sometimes, like we were talking about um, the show we just did on Talk More Talk, the last two shows of the top 100 solo Beatles songs as voted on by Rob Sheffield and Rolling yes. Stone. We even said... You know, this is a tough job for any of us. What yeah. 100 songs would you pick? You know, and uh, when there's so many songs out there to cherish that you think highly of, to ne well, to some people, 100 songs is a lot. I can come up with hundreds of songs that I love from the solo Beatles. It's not that easy. But if you narrow it down and say your top three, what songs immediately come to mind without you really thinking about it? Sometimes you learn a lot that way. You do. And especially when you can't do the cover songs and that's your face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, got it. When am I going to pick? Because it, it would, without a doubt, Stand By Me would have been in my top. You know, it, it's Lieber and Stellar, but it is John Lennon. There has Benny King has a rival and his name is John Lennon. <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of Beatle fans who feel that their covers of those songs are the definitive ones. And then there are some people who can favor, oh, you know, you can't top Little Richard's version of Long Tall Sally or whatever. Whoa, I don't know about that. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. it all depends upon your individual tastes. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You can't top rock and roll music, the Beatles version, to me. <laughs> Not, and I love Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry. As John Lennon said, Chuck Berry is another name for rock and roll or rock and roll is another name for Chuck Berry or whichever he said. But that is, I mean, he is, Chuck Berry is the quintessential rock and roller and that is it. Uh -huh. uh, and I think John can take his stuff and, and do it as well as Chuck did it. And I think one we didn't even talk about is Bad Boy. I mean, Bad oh, Boy. That's one of my favorites. Great song. A great <laughs> song. Uh -huh. Too much monkey business. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're great songs. So I just, I really, I love to learn and I love to try to step out of my comfort zone. And thank you for, for encouraging me to, to do that. Yeah. Well, when there are 
uh, cover versions to to listen to and appreciate. It's important to really study those songs because it was part of the development of the Beatles as a band and also as songwriters and who they were influenced by. Right. You know, when I hear a song like this is just my ears talking, but something like I'll follow the sun or tell me what you see. I hear Buddy Holly in that. Oh, without a doubt. That's, that's me. OK, well, not everybody will hear that, but I can I can see the parallel there. Yeah. Well, he, melodically he, there, you know, oh, you know, no. Buddy Holly was so important in Liverpool because he came, you know, to Liverpool and performed at the Phil. And even though the Beatles didn't go, Holly became Liverpool's hero. He is, he, they, they like Elvis. They listen to Elvis. They like Little Richard. They, uh, but Buddy Holly is the gold standard. And it, you can hear it in so many of their songs. Hmm. It just, he matters to that city. He still matters. Very true. Okay. Well, Jude, this has been amazing having you here. We'll have to invite you on again. And like I said, please keep us posted about the status of the next book. Okay. And uh, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, having the biographer on <laughs> more about the life than you probably wanted to know. But to me, you can never study an artist, any artist. It doesn't have to be a Beatle, any artist uh, without knowing their backstory, because it is their backstory that influences what they're painting or sculpting or writing. And with that backdrop, you understand what they're giving you as, as art. Mm -hmm. Indeed. <laughs> thank you so much jude thanks to all of you for watching and uh i'll be back soon thanks to all the new subscribers and peace and love folks all my videos end like this <laughs>